Now we have heard, you know, the thoughts that each one of them who who has reached a place, whether it is uh, as a immunologist, Dr. Uh, Sahu, who talked about uh, research in immunology, something which is uh, which is an area of how how you can perhaps even translate it using the, those experiences, especially he tried to tell you more about COVID vaccine stuff. That was because perhaps it's a hot burning area and most of the people uh, understand that. We also understood about uh, the implementation science research, which is very critical because what we know in terms of effective therapies, even if we could deliver that to the last person, we would perhaps make a huge difference. And implementation science research generally focuses on those areas because newer interventions may come, but the problem is even older interventions are not applied in an appropriate manner and therefore the effectiveness tends to go down dramatically. We heard Dr. Murekar trying to elucidate those issues and perhaps he reflected on one of the most important uh, initiative of the government on hypertension, which is recognized globally uh, as of now. We also heard thoughts of uh, Dr. Agarwal, especially on artificial use of artificial intelligence, digital technology, and those areas are going to become, they are going to be mainstay of uh, of any health program that would come tomorrow. So we have heard all this. Do we have some burning questions that people have? You know, we could take up only a couple of questions and then perhaps look at how we proceed ahead in terms of the time that is available to us. Is there anybody who wants to? Yeah, please do, please. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Vasudev Menon. Um, I used to be an immunologist and a virologist. Uh, my current persuasions are in the history and philosophy of science and medicine. So I have a question which pertains to the theme of today's topic, and I, I'm wondering if any of you could help me out here. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to understand what, if any, do we have a cogent um, and coherent national agenda when it comes to research, contemporary post-liberalization, what, what is it right now? Um, what are its, its long-term aspects and so on? Um, what we see looking at um, India right now, we have institutional aspirations and we have individual aspirations. How do these tie up to a national goal? So that's, that's my question. <laughs> that's a great question. No, <laughs> I think all of us should try to <laughs> answer in different let ways. Me, let me start the ball rolling. The all answers will only be partial answers. Institutional aspirations and individual aspirations can never be fully aligned, but it is possible to balance both within a given institution. When you speak of national institutions that typically have a very precise mandate, and it is reasonable for efforts in those institutions to be aligned with what that mandate was. We have over time seen a situation where everyone tries to be everything and the mandate gets scattered. That must be avoided going forward. On the other hand, beyond the national institutions, we have universities. Universities have always been a place for more wide open exploration, which may or may not match any national mandate. I personally imagine a system where universities are free to pursue wider directions of things, perhaps even disagree with the priorities laid out by the nation, because what is the nation? Nation is the people, and people in the universities are also people. While the top public institutions founded for a specific purpose strengthen themselves along that mandate. That's how I would see it. Yeah, so uh, one thing uh, is that, you know, any institute, it will have a mandate to do certain things, right? And therefore, uh, they may have a program, not necessarily always, where they would like to contribute uh, 
into that particular domain which uh, you that may not, you may not be so much passionate about or you may not like that much but that's something you know uh, there is something which is a larger good uh, one has to think and therefore it's a good the question always is what percent time effort you want to spend into that right so according to me uh, if somebody tells me i would be happy to spend 50% of my effort into a larger goal but i would like to keep 50% for myself to something which i really keen and would like to do ultimately science is is global whatever you do whatever knowledge you add to science is not restricted to an institute or or a particular state or the nation but it's a global right and therefore that is that is very very important that you do something which is critical or you also think that that's what you are passionate about so i i would like to you know suggest that you balance both right and again another question is when you are hired they hire you for a particular expertise right so they know they also know your field you are interested in so they would certainly let you do you know uh, to work on your what you are passionate about because that's why they have hired but they may like you to spend some time right to to do a larger good okay. well i'll just uh, add that uh, like india has a national health policy and similar line we also have a national research policy and this policy uh, at least for for the public funded institutes primarily focuses on doing research on on areas which are uh, important public health problems rather than very specific uh, Uh, this is burden areas so diseases which are highly prevalent or contributing highly to delhi's or disease burden are targeted for uh, research as a part of national research policy couple of a couple of comments to make on this issue one of the foremost principle that one must have join an institution where your passion is likely to be sustained through your career no because it is it is individual passion that will drive you rather than an institution or for that matter national priorities per se you will always identify a right kind of area if you are passionate about it second thing which i would say is uh, something which i try to promote throughout in my life No, not every area of research would be of interest to you when you work under an institution no, what you should do is try to create a niche area spend 30% of your time in the niche area and 70% can go into generic research which is a team work that you have to do uh, within an institution now your if you look at your own passion and there are times you will not find that national agenda fits into it you know in terms of priorities that are provided but it it is good to remember you have to be futuristic when you think in terms of what you would be taking because eventually you would like to see that it comes into it comes into some kind of evidence that the program will essentially use or the nation is likely to use so never ever worry it's only your inquiry how much you understand about your own subject that will make a difference and that's something which should be cultivated based on the passion you have in your own area any other question there was yeah uh, good morning sir um, i am a student of nutrition and dietetics from sihs and uh, my question is to arvin sehu sir sir that uh, in the indo burma border we have lots of refugees and uh, they are mostly those refugees are hiv positives so what is the status of contextualizing research in those areas no today we have moved far ahead in terms of uh, the national aids control program it is considered as one of the most successful program one of the most cost effective program globally now indo burma border that you referred to no there one of the problems is they tend to get infection 
by injecting drug use more often you know, because that falls into golden triangle and therefore injection drug use used to be a major major problem per se but today if you actually look at the coverage of uh, focused interventions that we have among different populations including injecting drug users is extremely strong so it would eventually mean that if these people, today we are into an era where we provide uh, antiretroviral therapy once you are diagnosed. No, what it does is it reduces the speed at which it can even be transmitted to other people and the risk of death is almost gone. No, as of now we say, if somebody who is HIV infected no, is put on antiretroviral therapy, his survival will be so long and it has nothing, be, whenever he is likely to die, perhaps he won't die due to HIV, but some other, you know, cause per se. So in terms of survival, whether it is Indo-Burma or whichever border, Indo-Burma is a porous border. And the second thing which we have to understand is, uh, in, there are lots of refugees who come from either uh, that area per se. Now, are they covered to large extent? Yes. Though when it comes to refugees, the issue that tends to come is, how do we provide care for somebody who may not be your national? So that challenge continues to exist. But as of now, survival-related issues perhaps don't exist if they are linked to ART services per se. Uh, even the risk of spread has gone down dramatically. But as I said, like we talk of famines, like we talk of certain natural calamities, refugees require a different strategy. Unfortunately for us, it is a problem uh, as to how to provide care to them because they don't, they are not our nationals per se. Any, any other question? Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm Shruti Shastri from Symbiosis School of Biological Sciences. My question is for Dr. Agarwal. You mentioned that science is essentially derived from humanity. All the bias that we might have might also translate into the research. But there's also been a progress in the field of AI and machine learning in the last few years. So do you believe that there might be a future where AI and machine learning would be able to do inherently human things, such as perhaps brainstorm ideas, analyze or even write scientific papers, um, generate code as well, in order to perhaps eliminate the bias that you were talking about? So one definition of AI is in which AI becomes able to do human-like tasks. There are other versions and AI scientists who think that's a very narrow way to start thinking about it. If we were thinking of patterned human responses that don't involve what one would call creativity, we will get there fast. The larger question then people ask is, well, can AI come up with a new theory like Einstein did? completely breaking away from everything other people had seen. One could argue that even statisticians using unbiased methods, finding clusters, although these are humans, are already able to find inconsistencies in previous data that are not. So you could, in theory, program an AI to find things that have not been seen before and report them. Would that be the equivalent of a theory? Probably not. Even if it came out with equations to explain it, would it be the equivalent of a theory? Probably not. The reason is explainability. The reason is a deeper thought that we currently do not have. So one way that people believe this entire field will move forward is by giving up on the current way of training AI systems in which you take a human task, use that as a training data, then look at the AI in terms of doing that task. This makes AI a slave with a gold standard being a human. And you know, no matter how many times you iterate the process, it cannot learn its own separate creativity. So I think it's gonna be a new field of AI science different from current CNNs or neural networks, which are primarily designed for standard testing, training, and validation. But yes, it will come sometime. There is no, I mean, 
you one could argue for those of you who are stronger believers that there is a grace from above for those of you it's a spontaneous emergence of a natural phenomena whatever happened in our brain can occur somewhere else I'm Nidip Joshi from Symbiosis School of Biological Sciences. I'm pursuing my master's in biotechnology. So my question is to Dr. Anurag sir. So we have seen that most pandemics that have caused like are from are zoonotic diseases from animals to humans. So, so basically, can AI detect these pathogens by any chance? And can it also like detect how will the course of pathogenesis be from in in animals and in humans? And can it also like determine what are the Who, who, who all are prone to these kind of diseases or anything like that, which ethnic groups are more vulnerable to diseases? Can AI predict this in the, in the coming future? And yeah, so that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to substitute the word data science for AI, because ultimately AI is a facet of data science. And then say the first thing data science would need is data. So now let's imagine a scenario in which things were regularly sequenced things were regularly measured statistical anomalies were routinely reported and one was able to fold proteins match protein protein interactions in silico which one can do in this scenario imagine in wuhan a new outbreak of illness starts the sequences coming out from those patients match previous sars viruses from bats wherever doesn't matter Predictions in silico show very high binding of the spike protein of that particular virus to ACE proteins of humans. And one could say this might be highly transmissible, might bind well. And if one also had all population data regarding who all got infected, one understands the aerosol mode of transmission far earlier. So in that sense, yes. Now imagine we are looking forward. What would India have to do to allow data science and genomics and everything put together, the fourth wave, to do this? One would have to identify the typical places of zoonotic jumps. One would have to have a system of surveillance of a multiple types of illnesses that include sequencing from the very beginning. One would have to make an automatic algorithm that looks for new sequences coming out of sick people. and then an entire in silico pipeline to see what all would it bind so today for example you could for using influenza strains see whether it's going to bind to deeper receptors or shallow receptors in the lung so yes it will occur but the foundation will remain our commitment to generate that data which will come back to normal human health workers human uh, normal sops and so nothing will be done by ai alone it will be all of us together <laughs>